my video. And there we go. We can, uh, you can see me for a moment here. Well, we're still getting the uh, YouTube screen up here. Hang on. And I'm not sure what you're seeing at the moment. Looks like I'm seeing your screen. So there we go. Okay, now we're seeing, uh, Lane, are we seeing the uh, correct screen there? Yep. Okay, good, thanks. Okay, folks, uh, welcome to our to our webinar. We got about a minute before we start here, but um, helping me out today is is a friend who's uh, in Central California, Lane Lisser. He's an aer uh, aerobatic pilot, and uh, we've been he's been uh, participating in my webinars for for several years. And uh, this go round, it just seemed like a little help was needed on the engineering side of stuff. So I have a flight engineer today, so I appreciate it, Lane. Thank you very much. <laughs> And, and Wayne's going to jump in if I really mess something up and tell me that, that hey, that's not what we're seeing here. So uh, we'll go from there. All right. My um, the big hand on my screen here. Except that I have one more thing I have to square away. I have to get the right PowerPoint screen up. There we go. Son of a gun. We are ready to roll. <clears throat> Cleared for takeoff, so to speak. I think we're I think we're going. Here we go. Okay, welcome to our, our webinar on the psychology of approach and landing. Many things in aviation revolve around psychology, and that's kind of become my specialty to do that. So we're going to explore that a little bit today. Don't worry, the picture there of the uh, Learjet, we're not, uh, this is not limited to jet approach and landings. We're going to do many different things. <clears throat> Before we uh, we really get into this. We have to do a little bit of house cleaning, housekeeping, I guess I should say. I, if you can see my office in the background, I need to do some house cleaning too, but that's beside the point. When we start these uh, live presentations, if we're doing them uh, at, a, at a, a location, we always tell you where the exits are, where the bathrooms are, all, all that sort of thing. I assume that wherever you are today, you know where the bathrooms are. But what if, uh, what if we have a system crash? Well, you don't need to know where the exits are, but um, Check my website and uh, we'll reschedule if we do that. Unlikely event. Well, I, I did one on one of these events on Monday and we were hit 60 mile an hour winds going on outside while I was doing it and I was really concerned. But uh, today it's calm. Of course, today will probably be the day. Uh, to the, oh, and by the way, I am um, located just west of Rochester, New York, right, uh, right by Lake Ontario and um, between Rochester and Buffalo, and it is snowing outside my house right now. So those of you who are in better weather areas, have, mer have mercy on me. Okay, I understand we have some folks uh, online who have not participated in any of my events previously, so I'll provide a brief introduction. My whole life has revolved around aviation. I took my first official flying lesson at the age of 14, soloed on my 16th birthday. That was in 1962, so uh, if you want to do the math, you know how old I am. I had a great career for which I am very, very thankful. I've flown everything from jets to cubs. Well, flight instructing has always been my preferred activity. Of course, um, you know, I always told people it was the most dangerous occupation you could have because uh, you might starve to death, but I did a lot of other things with that besides that, but I always liked instructing the best. I've given uh, a little more than 8,000 hours of dual instruction and I've continued with my psychology background to do work in human factors. And for five years, I served on the safety committee of the National Business Aviation Association as the human factors person. I was in their uh, fitness for duty working group. I was also an annual presenter at their convention and I am a fast team lead representative. All right, I wanna thank Avemco Insurance for their sponsorship. They're not specifically sponsoring these events, but over the last year, they've sponsored some of my live events and they've paid me royalties for some articles I've uh, posted on their website and they have been great to work with. And they're really uh, interested in promoting safety. They're, they're very nice people to work with and, and I, I can't say enough good about working with them as a, as a sponsor. You may or may not know that um, Avemco pays for those wings pins. If you complete a phase of wings and earn a pin, uh, that's where those come from. All right. <clears throat> This seems a little extreme, doesn't it? My brain can't be trusted. But unfortunately, it's true. In this presentation, we're going to see how external factors sometimes have an adverse effect on how we perform. These external factors go beyond simply pressuring us to uh, press the envelope. 
they can sometimes affect the way we perceive the situation, causing us to make what would be a reasonable decision if it weren't based on flawed data. So our objectives in this course, um, we want to learn about three psychological principles that may affect how a pilot conducts an approach and landing. And we want to learn how to prevent these principles from interfering with a safe conduct of an approach and landing. Let's first talk a little bit about perception. Perception is the process of attaining awareness of understanding of our sensory information. Our perceptions are formed by the brain. <clears throat> it gives meanings to the messages received through our five senses. Now, perception alters what humans see. It's altered into a diluted version of reality, which ultimately corrupts the way humans perceive the truth. When people view something with a preconceived idea about it, they tend to take those preconceived ideas and see them whether or not they're accurate. What do you see here? Is this a light vase on a black background? Or is it a pair of black faces on a light background? You can see it both ways and most people can are able to switch between, uh, between seeing the ways. What about this one? Are all the horizontal lines here parallel? Actually, they are, but it doesn't seem that way, does it? So an example of an illusion that is known to affect pilots is the runway width illusion. A narrower than usual runway can create the illusion of being higher than the actual altitude, while an unusually wide runway can create the opposite illusion. Sometimes we see what we want to see. Spectators may not all perceive a foul the same way, depending on which uh, side of an event they, they favor. Our basic needs are air, water, and food. Need for a bathroom can be considered a basic need, at least to me. That also includes the need to protect ourselves, so defense mechanisms, uh, defense mechanisms will come into play. They include rationalization, denial of reality, flight, projection, aggression, regression, compensation, and reaction formation. For this discussion, we're also Let's take a hypothetical example. Many pilots, including me, maybe even especially me, are coffee drinkers. We start off the morning with one or more cups of coffee before leaving the house. Um, Travel mug goes along for the ride to the airport. Here's another cup of coffee, uh, another cup and a half of coffee. If it's a long drive or if there are traffic delays, we might find a drive through to replenish the coffee. And in extreme cases, replenish it yet again. And we all know that any FBO worth their name has an ample supply of free coffee going on as well. All right. And then we depart on a really, really, really long flight. Visions of porcelain fixtures dance in our heads. Ah, finally, we're on final. Oh, only a few more minutes to the restroom. But somehow we managed to get too high and too fast. Hmm, what will be our perception of the situation? Will we recognize that we're high and fast? Or will our psychological, sorry, I'm sorry, our physiological need for a restroom cause us to see the approach as being normal? This accident might be an example of perception being influenced by external factors. Here's a quote from the official NTSB report. As the pilot neared the airport, he decided to land as the passengers needed to use the airport's facilities. I think we know which facilities. Using several visual clues, including some nearby vegetation, he estimated that the runway had a layer of snow on the surface that was several inches of depth. The airplane touched down on the snow-covered runway, and the airplane suddenly stopped, nosing over inverted. Once on the ground, the pilot found that the snow was actually over a foot deep. The report implies that the reason for landing was a need to use the restroom. It also states that the pilot judged the snow death by visual uh, cues, including nearby vegetation. 
The vegetation shown in the photo could have been perceived as a very small bush when it was in fact the top of a small tree. Could the pilot's perception have been influenced by the pressure to land? We can't be sure, um, but there are examples in which pilots may have seen what they want to see rather than what was actually there. He really wanted to land and I, I've told a story on other events where uh, I got into a situation like that and I did something really, really stupid, didn't end in an accident, but it, it certainly could have been too. Sometimes we see what we expect to see or we deny what we really see. This is sometimes a difficult situation to overcome. And I just realized that I still have my video camera on. Let me, uh, it'll be cleaner, cleaner presentation without the video. There we go. Okay. Um, the use of bugs that can be set to predetermined speeds on an airspeed indicator can serve as reminders. Calculating the uh, MSL altitude that the airplane should be descending through when turning final or one, say a half mile from final can also be helpful. But the best practice is to be aware that our perceptions sometimes are not accurate and it uh, take a second look at the critical items, especially when we know we are under pressure. A basic premise of learning theory is that it takes time and opportunity to learn. In other words, learning doesn't happen all at once, but rather over a time span. In addition to time and opportunity, the, the actual learning event must be available. So an example might be a new instrument student learning to enter and fly a holding pattern. Time must be spent in practice. Usually this time will be spread over several lessons. It takes time after each practice session for the brain to process all the perceptions generated by the experiences in that, uh, that practice session. Now the opportunity to learn has to also be present. The student must be given the chance to practice under the instructor's uh, guidance and then to practice and self-correct any mistakes. We've all been there in, in various things and learning certain things with the airplane. For this discussion, the time and opportunity concept can be considered to be experience. The experience may or may not be helpful. It is not helpful if it leads to false expectations such as expecting to break out in the clouds, uh, break out of the clouds rather, when at a certain altitude. Now in the case of uncertainty, expectation is what is considered the most likely to happen. That's an important concept. In the case of uncertainty, our expectation is what is considered the most likely to happen. An expectation which is a belief that is centered on the future may or may not be realistic. We know that, right? A less advantageous uh, result gives rise to the emotion of disappointment. If something happens that is not at all expected, then it's not a disappointment, but the, the emotion is a surprise. Okay, so it's an important concept. We've developed expectations about what's going to happen. Operant conditioning or just conditioning is the use of consequences to modify the occurrence and form of behavior. Students of behavioral psychology study how lab animals can be uh, conditioned to perform complex tasks by being rewarded for correct actions. These same principles apply to humans. It's called a Skinner box there. And that, that brings back a lot of memories for me. That was my major. And I, I spent many, many hours dealing with rats and other mammals and, and Skinner boxes. And in one course I took, it was an advanced course and our rat had to pass a test at the end. We had to train the rat at the end of the course. And uh, I, when I'd go home on a vacation or a weekend, I took my rat with me because if your rat died, you failed the course. Well, you didn't, they give you another rat, but there was no way you could get that rat changed by the end of the semester. And my girlfriend at the time, who is my wife now, was tasked with holding my rat in a small cage on her lap for the three hour drive home for vacations and, uh, and so on. And uh, she frequently reminds me of that adventure that she had with me on that. Anyway, conditioning, rats in Skinner boxes. When we push the power button on the remote control, we expect to see the TV come on, right? That's an expectation that's created by many experiences in which we push the button and in fact, it worked. If it doesn't, what do we do? Most people stand there and keep pushing the button or maybe push the button harder, but we have an expectation of what that button is going to do. Now let's take a look at an accident that just might've been the result of conditioning. Pilots who fly instrument approaches regularly 
know that very few approaches actually involve flying to the approach minimums and then having to execute a missed approach. Each time a pilot flies an approach and has the runway in sight before reaching minimums, he or she is just a little bit more conditioned that all approaches are gonna end that way. This is how this approach ended. Miraculously, the pilot was not seriously injured, believe it or not, and no one on the ground was hurt. Even major property damage uh, to the houses that were narrowly missed was avoided. This is uh, an older accident from, I think, 2005, but it, 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 it's pretty much a, an every other week occurrence in the United States, this, the same type. The pilot was appropriately rated, and he met recent experience requirements for instrument flight. The flight originated in Millbrook, New York. According to the forecast and to the reports as he neared his destination, the pilot expected to break out before reaching his minima for the airport. The pilot was cleared for the VOR approach to runway 14. He had been told that the visibility was a mile and a half, but in fact, it was worse. He was cleared to land when he was 3.6 miles from the runway. This is the profile view and minima section for the approach chart for runway 14 that was current on the day of the accident. Note the pilot was authorized to descend to 1,700 feet prior to reaching the four mile DME fix. Note that the DME minimums for the approach allowed the pilot to descend to 1,460 feet before passing the four mile DME fix. Note also that the airport elevation is 1,099 feet MSL. This would allow him to descend to, according to the chart, 373 feet above the airport, anywhere inside the four mile DME fix. Unfortunately, he did not realize that he had continued his descent well below his minimum descent altitude and saw he, until he saw the trees outside the windshield through the fog. This is a view looking backward along the airplane's flight path. This is the stand of trees that he saw at the last minute. You can see a couple of broken ones up there in the top. The accident occurred in an upscale residential neighborhood. Here, the airplane is seen inverted in the driveway of one of the houses. Note the fog is still present. The white material around the airplane is not snow. It's a uh, fire suppressant applied by the fire department. This photo was taken just a bit later when some of the fog had cleared. Note that the right wing is completely gone from the airplane. Miraculously, there was no fire. There was ample fuel aboard, so this was not a fuel-related accident. It's amazing that the pilot was not seriously injured. Um, and, and I don't have any particular affiliation with Mooney and I've never had much experience in a Mooney or ever, ever owned one, but I'll tell you what, I have seen a lot of accident photos involving Moonies where the passenger compartment stayed completely intact and the people came scrambling out. So I take that as some sort of an endorsement for that airframe. Anyway, the uh, arrow indicates where the airplane passed between two houses. Can you believe that? <laughs> There's not much space there. This is another view looking backward along the airplane's path between the two houses. Just a miracle that one of those houses didn't get clocked because this guy totally had no control once he was on the ground for sure. A witness in one of the houses reporting seeing the airplane careening through the yard, shedding parts. I mean, that was a quote. It was careening through the yard and it was shedding parts. Not good. Only minor property damage occurred to this rain gutter and to the siding, a gas grill that you can't see in the picture uh, with the propane tank attached was missed by inches as the airplane came through there. This is another uh, view showing a, 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 an airplane part of some kind that was shed and the damage to the house siding. That's, that's the total property damage to the, uh, any of the structures around there it was that hole in the siding and the, and the gutter came down. Very fortunate. The official NTSB report on this accident states, while on a VOR approach, the pilot reported to the control tower that he was 3.5 miles from the airport. Shortly thereafter, 
The pilot saw the tops of the trees about 50 feet in front of the airplane. Without sufficient time to arrest the descent, the airplane impacted trees and the ground, resulting in substantial damage. Yeah, I, I think that airplane is substantially damaged. The pilot additionally stated, I cannot really explain why I let the airplane descend too low. I felt comfortable with the approach throughout. I simply was too low, too far away from the airport. And the NTSB concludes in their probable cause finding, the pilot's failure to comply with a published instrument approach procedure, which resulted in an in-flight collision with trees. So what did we say about expectations? We're conditioned to expect a successful outcome to our approaches and to not have to execute a missed approach unless it's a training or a certification flight. You know, you get with the instructor, you get with a, in a check ride, oh boy, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm gonna make a go around here, but on our normal flying, not so much. That can lead to complacency. Not safe, but guess what? Human nature, we're all humans. We must force ourselves to expect to fly the airplane to the approach minimums and then execute a missed approach each and every time. A good start, memorize at least the first few steps of the missed approach procedure before beginning the approach. And conditioning errors can also be avoided by, uh, on approaches by reviewing critical elements of the approach before it's begun. The use of an uh, approach briefing checklist. I'm a big believer in that. Uh, that can help us get into the right frame of mind before beginning any approach. Uh, even VFR approaches are safer if an approach briefing checklist is used. The one shown here is for uh, VFR and suitable for many light airplanes. The checklist can be modified to meet the needs and preferences of any pilot, but it's a good idea to use one. And you know what? Even if you're alone in the airplane, give that approach briefing checklist, even if it's just to yourself. I do. Always have. Okay, let's take a, a quick look at another psychological principle that may come into play. This one comes from the field of social psychology and it's called normative social influence, often called just norms. It becomes a factor whenever more than one person is involved in decisions or in the outcome of those decisions. In aviation, the additional person or persons can be another crew member, an instructor, a student, an evaluator, an air traffic controller, even a passenger. Normative social influence occurs when one conforms in order to be liked or accepted by the members of the group. A very non-scientific term for this might be the macho wimp. In other words, a person may try to appear brave, smart, or strong by going along with something that he or she doesn't think is right or safe. In other words, the person is trying to appear macho, but is really a wimp in the fact that he or she is complying with the wishes of another rather than taking a stand. I know it's easy to say, um, it isn't easy to say, this isn't a good idea. I'm out of here, all the, the kids, you know, daring each other to jump off the bridge. You know, as teenagers, um, they're probably gonna do it. Hopefully we're all a little bit older than that. We've learned not to, but um, you know, we see too many accidents that, um, that didn't go well because somebody went along with the group. All right, this accident um, is, <laughs> is quite detailed and it involves a Gulfstream G3. Now you may think, well, I don't fly airplanes like that. Why do I care? This accident happened in G3 with two extremely experienced pilots on board. And I can illustrate to you accidents that happened in very similar situations in a Cessna 172 with two pilots on board. All right, the aircraft struck a light pole and crashed about three miles southwest of Hobby Airport in Houston. He was on an instrument approach, ILS-2, uh, um, yeah, the ILS-2 approach to runway four. I'm sorry. Two pilots and the flight attendant were killed. An individual in, uh, in a vehicle near the airport received minor injuries. And of course, the airplane was destroyed by impact forces. This is a light pole located next to the one that was struck by the airplane. That's a big light pole, okay? But also notice it's not really all that tall went just like it was hit. This is the view looking down the approach path. Note the highway and the light poles in the foreground. And then note the runway way off in the distance. These photos are all NTSB photos. Note the ground scar from the wreckage in the ensuing fire. Another view of the ground scar, not pretty. 
This is the part of the wreckage that was not consumed by post-crash fire. The flight departed Dallas about 0530, according to the operator, uh, which was Business Jet Services, a charter company based in Dallas. The departure was delayed because of poor weather conditions at both Houston and Dallas. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The captain was the flying pilot and the first officer performed the non-flying pilot duties. It was a repositioning flight from Dallas to Houston to pick up former president George H.W. Bush for a flight to Ecuador. The flight was scheduled to depart about 0500, but it didn't depart until about 0530. The flight was scheduled to depart Houston at 0654. The accident occurred at 0615. So they were getting pretty tight on their time, um, you know, to get in there to pick up a former president. The entire area was fogged in. The weather was uh, broken clouds at 100 feet and an overcast at 9,000 feet. The visibility was 1,600 feet in fog. Wind was calm. It was 0614 local time in the fall, so the lighting condition was dark. The 67-year-old captain, and who was the flying pilot, was exceptionally well qualified. He had been the chief pilot for the company until voluntarily stepping down four months prior to the accident. He continued as a Czech airman for the company. He had 19,000 hours total time and he had 1,000 hours in Gulfstream jets. He had 55 hours in the accident airplane in the previous 12 months. Pretty experienced guy, huh? Okay, what about the first officer? He was supposedly the non-flying pilot on here. The 62-year-old first officer and non-flying pilot was also extremely well qualified. He was serving as the company chief pilot at the time of this accident. He also had about 19,000 hours total flying time, including 1,700 hours in Gulfstream jets. He had 18 hours in the accident airplane in the preceding eight months. So we got two really, really, really super experienced pilots up front. Now we're going to join the accident sequence at 0553 local time as the pilots received the Houston ATIS. The recording reported that the wind was calm, the visibility one, one eighth mile in fog, one eighth mile in fog. Okay. The um, runway visual range or RVR was variable between 1600 and 2400 feet. It was also reported that were broken clouds at 100 feet and an overcast way up at 9000 feet. Now, company procedures called for the flying pilot to brief the approach. But in this case, the non-flying pilot did the briefing. The briefing was incomplete per company procedures. An excerpt of the briefing taken from the NTSB report is shown here. But here's the two most experienced people in the company, both in effect Czech airmen, all right? There's a procedure for an approach briefing and who would you expect would be the least likely to do that? Well, these two guys didn't do it right. This is the plan view for the ILS approach to runway four at Houston. Give you a second to look at that one. Okay. At 0559 local time, the first officer contacted Houston Approach Control. His transmission was normal with Approach Gulfstream 85 Victor Tangles with you out of 8,000 for 1,000. Information kilo. The controller cleared the flight directly to Carco, that's an intersection, adding, when you're able for the ILS runway four. The first officer acknowledged the transmission, however, he read back ILS 14 instead of runway four. He then stated, I'll set up our ILS in here, 109.9. At 0605, 0605 local time, the airplane was 29 miles northwest of Houston at 11,000 feet. Approach control instructed the crew to descend and maintain 3,000 feet. At 0609, the first officer stated that, uh, or started the before landing checklist. About a minute later, he stated that the airplane was five miles from Carco intersection. So we see our Gulf Stream coming in here. At 0610, 
ATC instructed the crew to turn left to 070, maintain 2000 or above until established on the localizer, cleared ILS runway for approach. Very familiar phraseology, right? At 0611, the first officer stated that the localizer was alive, meaning that the localizer needle had moved off its peg and that they were intersecting the localizer course. That's a common call. Less than a minute later, the first officer reported in with Houston Tower and received a landing clearance. At this time, the airplane was at 2,300 feet and 11 miles southwest of Houston. At 0612 and 15 seconds, the captain asked the first officer to get the RVR. He then stated, I can't get approach mode on my thing. My thing referring to the flight management system display. The first officer replied that he could not get the approach mode to activate either. About 0613, the airplane descended through 2000 feet. The airplane performance study showed that the airplane was about 1000 feet below the glide slope at this, uh, at this time and that the airplane remained 600 to 1,000 feet below the glide scope until impact. At 0612 and 31 seconds, the controller reported to the first officer that the RVR was 1,600 feet. The first officer acknowledged the transmission. At 0612 and 40 seconds, the first officer stated, gear down. At 0612 and 57 seconds, the first officer asked, what is wrong with this? The captain responded, I don't know. All right, now stop here for just a second. Here we are in a Gulf Stream, coming down through fog, solid IFR. It's gonna be a close to minimums approach for sure at best, okay? Two real experienced pilots up front and there's something wrong. They're not, they're, they're not connecting with this. There's something going on here. Their, their display isn't correct. So, what do we do? We go around. Uh, that would have been nice, but if we go around, we're going to be late to pick up a former president of the United States. Not a good idea, so let's keep going. So at 0613 and three seconds, the first officer asked, what do we have set wrong? We have long range navigation or something that we shouldn't have? Five seconds later, the captain reported, got nav, VOR1. The first officer stated, okay, we're high on the glide slope now, and the captain replied, just gonna to have to do it this way. Not sure what this way meant. At 0613 and 24 seconds, the first officer stated, guess so, yeah, you're on the glide slope now. However, the airplane performance study showed that about the time that the first officer made the comments about the glide scope, the airplane was an altitude of about 1700 feet and was 700 feet below the glide slope. The minimum section of the approach chart is shown here, up at the top. It indicates that the airplane could descend on the glide slope to an altitude of 244 feet. This would put the airplane 200 feet above the runway. At 0613 and 44 seconds, the captain asked the first officer if they were going to descend to an altitude of 244 feet and the first officer replied, yeah. The airplane performance study indicated that about 0614, the airplane was at an altitude of about a thousand feet. At 0614 and five seconds, the captain asked, what happened? Did you change my frequency? The first officer responded, yeah, we were down there. The VOR frequency was on. I think down there meant we were below where we were supposed to be. He then stated, we're all squared away now, you got it. The captain responded, yeah, but I don't know if I can get back on it in time. The FO replied, yeah, you will, you're squared away now. They were anything but squared away. It's quite likely that both pilots were confusing the fast slow speed indicator with the glide slope indicator. There's an FAA advisory circular for transport category airplane electronic display systems. And that was uh, dated way back in 1987. It provides guidance on the location of essential flight instrument displays, including the glide slope indicator. The advisory circular recommends standardizing the location of the glide slope indicator to the right side of the main display. However, the accident airplane was manufactured before the guidance was issued. Five other company airplanes flown by the accident pilots were configured with the glide slope indicator on the left side. On these air, uh, of these airplanes, four had fast slow indicators on the right side and one had no indicator on the right side. Three of the company airplanes flown by the accident pilots had the glide slope on the right side. 
The indicator shown here on the left is similar to one to the one in the accident airplane. The glide slope indicator is on the left side of the display. And the fast slow indicator is on the right side of the display. The indicator on the right is similar to the indicator in several other company airplanes with the glide slope uh, on the right and the fast slow indicator on the left. The airplane performance study showed that shortly after the captain's question regarding the frequency, the airplane turned right and subsequently intersected the ILS runway four localizer center line. About this time, the airplane was at an altitude of about 900 feet and was 800 feet below the glide slope. At 061432 seconds, the first officer stated, I'm, I'm outside. Now that didn't mean he was seeing anything outside, but, but in a multi-crew environment, that's what you do. The non-flying pilot shifts the gauge to looking out, giving eyes, hopefully a couple of seconds to adjust so that, so that that person can make the call, I've got the runway, okay? So he said, I'm outside, I'm outside. And eight seconds later, he stated, okay, coming up on 244. I mean, that's their minimum, uh, uh, minimum descent altitude, not minimum descent altitude. It's the minimum altitude for the uh, instrument landing system approach. At 06, 14 and 35 seconds, the automated radar terminal system minimum safe altitude warning provided visual and oral warnings to the Houston TRACON and Houston air traffic control towers. At 06, 14 and 42 seconds, the captain completed the before landing checklist stating, give me full flaps. At 06, 14 and 45.2 seconds, the cockpit voice recorder uh, had the first officer state up seven times in quick succession, up, 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 meaning let's get out of here. The CVR recorded the uh, uh, Houston air traffic controller simultaneously state, check your altitude. Altitude indicates 400 feet. The flight crew did not respond to the controller's transmission and no further communications were received from the flight crew. The airplane performance study showed that the airplane tracked the ILS runway four localizer and continued to descend until about 0614 and 47 seconds. The airplane impacted a light pole at an altitude of about 198 feet and about three and a quarter miles from the runway threshold. In my graphic there, you can see the light pole coming up. Now, contrary to extensive training and experience, the crew continued an, an approach that they both knew was not stabilized. If you've been on my presentation before, you know that one of my things I harp on is if the approach isn't stabilized, get out of there. And that's for both VFR and IFR. So the, the, they continued this approach that wasn't stabilized. And who are they? They're the two most experienced pilots in the company. Also a simple cross check of altitude at outer marker probably would have caught the error. All instrument pilots are taught that, double check things. You know, They, they always publish what the altitude is supposed to be at the outer marker. If you're below it, something's not right, right. Both pilots were aware that something wasn't right, yet they continued the approach in low IFR conditions. Why'd they do that? Perhaps it was normative social influence, norms. There was considerable pressure to not be late arriving to pick up a former president of the United States. Executing a missed approach would have surely caused them to be late. So this is external factors, pressure. But perhaps, here's where the norms come in. Neither pilot wanted to be the one to speak up and say, let's get out of here and figure this out. Each pilot went along with the errors knowing full well that this was not good. Perhaps if one of the pilots had been a junior pilot, the senior pilot would have been more likely to set the example and execute a missed approach. We know what was said, said in the cockpit, but we don't know what uh, the thoughts of those pilots are, okay? The lessons to be learned from this should be that we should never let our pride dictate our judgment. If something doesn't seem right on the approach, whether it's VFR or IFR, then it probably isn't right. Execute a go around or a missed approach and sort out the problem and fly another approach. So, Let's summarize. Perception. 
we talked about perception. It's, it's how our brain processes what comes in. Um, our eyes take the information in. They don't filter it. Our ears take the information in. They don't filter it, smell, taste, touch. But our brain is like a big filter here and it sorts all this stuff out. And like we saw in the beginning with some of those uh, tricky graphics, we see sometimes see what we expect to see or what we want to see. Their perception was that they were seeing the right things. And we should be careful with that. Conditioning, this is our expectation. Every time we do something and it works out, we're conditioned to do it that same way again. Um, I get into this a lot. Um, there are other term, terms for this as well, but um, the pilot who doesn't take a sample of the fuel before a flight, every time skip sampling the fuel before the flight and nothing bad happens, we are conditioned that much more to not sample the fuel on the next flight. And eventually we get to the point of, ah, I don't need to do that. It doesn't even cross our mind that we need to sample fuel or look in fuel tanks or um, you know, do a thorough pre-flight inspection. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Every time we skip something that we know we should do and we get away with it, they're just that much more likely to do it again. It also applies to uh, ducking under on approaches. You know, you fly an IFR approach down like a localizer approach. Well, I don't quite see the runway. Well, maybe I'll go down another 50 feet and see. We do it, we see the runway, we land, we're successful. Ah, now guess what? We're conditioned to do it again. So all the rules, um, the rules and the procedures that we have, of which there are many, 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 but they're all written in blood. Somebody died before that rule was written. I'll guarantee that. We may not know the details of all of them, but there's a reason for all of them. And we really don't want to be out there reinventing the wheel. All right, then we talked about norms or normative social influence. That's not wanting to go against the group. I see that a lot in general aviation. I see that a lot, a lot in general aviation. Some of the smaller local airports, um, I'm familiar with one, I certainly won't mention it, but uh, which one, but um, using a checklist is considered something for sissies. Nobody at that airport uses a checklist, nobody. They have them in the airplanes, but they don't use them because, you know, we're pilots and we don't need that. We won't forget anything. Well, I gave a, um, a, a, an example, um, a flight review. Yeah, there's the word, flight review once to a pilot that flew out of that, that airport. And um, it was in a Cessna 172. And I was extremely familiar with 172. Is Maybe I'm rationalizing. Yeah, but I thought, all right, I'm going to let this guy go and see uh, what he does. And he did, he went through pretty much everything, except for one thing, he forgot to turn the transponder on before he took off. Transponder was in standby and he took off. Well, uh, this airport was, was not inside, but it was very, very close to class C airspace. So, you know, class C, you call them, you let them know you're coming. Once they respond, they identify you, you can continue in. So I told this guy, I gave him a heading. I said, let's fly over here. And what are you going to do? Well, okay. He called and called class C and they said, uh, not receiving your transponder. And he looked around, he looked around, he looked around. He said, oh, I guess the transponder isn't working today. Transponder's in op, he told him. I said, okay. I let him do the, <laughs> the whole flight and, and came back. And um, just before we landed, I said, I'm going to fly the airplane a minute. And I want you to run through your before takeoff checklist. And he got right down through and he said, oh, <laughs> he noticed it transponder was on, was on standby. I said, well, you know, that could have been, that was a transponder. Nothing terrible happened. It could have been setting the flaps correctly. It could have been setting the trim in some airplanes. It could have been where the fuel selector is. We don't do that. We use the checklist. I'm sure that he didn't use a checklist anymore either, but that happens. All right. And then of course, there are many, many more factors. Uh, if you followed any of my work, psychology is my thing. And, and I really get into this stuff. Uh, there are cognitive biases. Um, I have a YouTube video on that called um, the bias bundle bomb, if you're interested. Uh, three cognitive biases, illusory superiority, and um, a couple other ones that, that follow along with that one to show what happens. Pressure, sometimes called external factors. Um, we've made a promise to take somebody somewhere, and by God, we're going to take them there. And even though the weather isn't good or the airplane, uh, the engine's running rough or whatever, or um, fatigue, 
That's a big one. Fatigue, stress, medications. I just did a presentation, I think, on that last week. And there are a lot more. There are tons and tons and tons of things that that play into the psychology. And it's not just the approach and landing. Of course, there's the psychology of the takeoff. And there's the, the psychology of continuing into adverse weather. Um, scud run. Are we going to scud run? Are we going to turn around? Are we going to go into the clouds, even though we're not supposed to be in the clouds? Or many, many, many um, factors that, um, that go on there. All right, looks like we might um, have a little time for some discussion at the end here before we, um, before we totally wrap this up. Again, I want to thank Avemco for their sponsorship. They've been very great people to work with, and they made it possible for me to upgrade to a webinar subscription, which made it a whole lot um, easier than just doing the, um, uh, the meeting thing. So thank you, Avemco. For me, um, I have a website, genebenson.com. There are links on there to uh, online courses. All the online courses, except for one, are free. Some of them are valid for WINGS credit. Uh, the one that isn't free is valid for all three WINGS credit. It's a Human Factors Ground School. And you will find on the website a, a link to get 50% off on that course if you're so inclined. Also, from my website, you can sign up for my free newsletter, uh, Vectors for Safety. That comes out once a month or more frequently lately since I've been uh, posting when these uh, events were coming up. And uh, shameless plug, I have some books available on amazon.com. If you just search for books by Gene Benson, you'll find them, or I have links to them on my website. The 50 Years of Flying Insights is available both in uh, paperback and Kindle, and the other two, which are collections of articles um, I've written over the years are available strictly in Kindle. So, all right. Um, we're not closing out yet, but let me just say, um, fly, always fly like your life depends on it. I guess I didn't format that properly for the screen there, did I? But anyway, uh, please always fly like your life depends on it. That's how I sign my emails and, uh, and I go, go from there. All right, I am going to turn my video camera back on and I'm going to stop the screen share, I think. And there I am. Yeah, hey, Gene, can you see uh, Manny has his hand up? Okay, let's see. Uh, Manny, I'm going to open your microphone. Yes, sir, what would you like to tell us or ask us? I just want to clarify that that final approach there, the FMS was set to, I think it was 1-4 instead of runway 4. Can you clarify that? Oh, yeah. they um, It wasn't set for the wrong runway. In the beginning, the, um, in the transcript, the pilot that responded to the controller said the wrong runway. But after that, he, they were squared away on the runway. I think I just mentioned that only it was part of the transcript, but I put it in there just to show that maybe they weren't quite as on top of things as they might have been at that point. But no, they were set up for the wrong runway. The, the problem was that they were looking at the glide scope, uh, which wasn't the glide scope. There was a, there's two ribbon indicators, uh, one for glide scope and one for airspeed, and they were confused as to which was which. And I think they switched in the process of uh, thinking which one was which one, and they were they thought they, they were trying to get on the glide scope by adjusting the airspeed, and then they were trying to adjust the airspeed by getting on the glide scope, and they just weren't sure what they were seeing there, and that was the whole basis of the problem. Right. Can you hear me still? Yes, go ahead. Um, additionally, I've never seen that uh, fast slow on a on a on a uh, attitude indicator or a. Is that just particular to the Gulf Stream, or is that pretty? Oh no, that's uh, that's that's a very common uh, in in the business jets, but it's also come come down to general aviation. There's some uh, single engine general aviation airplanes that have that now, uh, part of the advanced avionics that that some of them have. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I'll I will close Manny's mic, and uh, Edward has his hand up. Edward, can you hear us? I don't see any microphone symbol for Edward, though. Let me click out to talk. Edward? Hello, Edward. Okay, I guess we can't reach Edward. Let me see if there are any. I'm going to lower all the hands now. And... Gene Calvin has a question there. He says, can you show that checklist uh, review placard again? Ah, the um, approach briefing checklist? 
I will, I will try. Bear with me. Bear with me. I have to go back here a few slides. I think we can find it. Uh, well, hang on. I can't seem to. Here we go. Maybe. Maybe. Mm. Looking for it. Um, oh, I just found it. All right, let me see if I can run that. And let me see if I can share my screen. Well, ah, here we go. <laughs> the meeting controls <laughs> move around. <laughs> All right. Are you seeing that? Is that what you're looking for? Lane, are you seeing that? I'm seeing that, yeah. So it's okay. got the approach briefing checklist showing. And yeah, I think that's what uh, we're going to. If you would like a copy of that, shoot me an email and I can send you a PDF of that. Not a, not a problem at all. Yeah, Kelvin said, got it. Thanks. Okay, and then good. also, uh, James Hessman has a question there. He wants to know is there any indication as to why these two pilots were not using their autopilot for this approach? Good question. Um, I'm trying to get my meeting controls back here and it's not. I'm kind of at a loss. I lost everything that I've got here. I'm not seeing my uh, attendee list anymore. Hang on with me, maybe I can get that back. No, nope, that seems to be lost and gone forever somehow. So I cannot see whose hands are up or... So let me see. I have no control over that. I've, I've completely lost well, wait a minute, hang on a second, hang on a second, hang on a second. Well, I'm gonna participant again. Okay, got it back, found it, found it, found it. Okay, uh, now of course in the process of that, I uh, forgot the question, <laughs> what's the question again? <laughs> no, senior moment, that. senior moment. <laughs> James wanted to know, is there any indication uh, as to why these two guys were not using their autopilots for the approach? Yeah, that'd be a real good, uh, real good question. Nothing came up about that. And there apparently was not a flight data recorder in the airplane. All they had was a cockpit voice recorder. Um, I think today they would be required to have a flight data recorder, but I think I, they probably weren't now. Um, here's my guess. My guess is that they had tried to use the autopilot and it wouldn't lock up because they couldn't they couldn't get things squared away, and that somehow that that wasn't picked up on the CVR. Or maybe they just decided to hand fly the approach for practice. I I don't know, but uh, you know, the autopilot uh, probably would have saved the day in one way or the other. It would have saved the day either because they couldn't get it to couple, or because it would have actually flown the approach correctly. I'm, and I'm not sure which, but yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. That's a that's a good question. Very good question. Why? We had a this this was became a classic accident at uh, NBAA for for years. This accident was talked about, and it was just not a good choice to put these two um, these same two guys in the airplane. Um, two really experienced pilots sometimes are not the safest thing unless 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 there are some real established standards and they comply with the standards. I mean, had they complied with the, with, with the procedures, they would have been okay, not standards, but procedures. Had they complied with the procedures, they would have been okay. But there's a seems to be a real tendency for a couple of experienced pilots to get in an airplane and kind of do it their own way. Now, you don't see that in the airlines because uh, it's, it's all monitored. I mean, there's the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder and um, they, they pretty much uh, comply, but in other cases, I'm, I'm familiar with an accident. Fortunately, nobody got hurt. Um, this happened in New Hampshire, oh, probably 12, 14 years ago. There was a guy, it was two, air, two airline captains. They were captains for different airlines and they were friends. They lived in the same area. 
And one of them owned a beautiful Beach 18 that had been restored. It was, um, it looked like a World War II vintage airplane. They, those were used for um, VIP transport a lot in World War II. And that guy needed um, a flight review. So he recruited his fellow airline pilot to go, who was also a flight instructor, to give him a flight review in the airplane. And the, 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 the pilot giving the flight review, who should have been the non-flying pilot, um, shut off the fuel to one of the engines. It'd be a normal kind of thing to do and kudos for actually doing a simulated engine out. And um, unfortunately he did it fairly low and the flying pilot reached over and uh, grabbed the prop controls and the mixture controls and secured the other engine, which was running fine. And um, they went in, the airplane got pretty well banged up. I don't think it was destroyed, but it got pretty well banged up in the process. But the, the moral of the story there was that, that these two guys hadn't established any procedures for really for who was doing what and who was flying the airplane and what was going to happen. And that we really, you know, in a multi-engine airplane, you really shouldn't be shutting any engine down unless you're at least 5,000 feet above the ground. That's, that's my opinion. Because um, if you can't get it started, you want to sure want to be able to get back to an airport. Um, and, and, and I think they would have agreed on that, but they hadn't talked about minimum altitudes and just kind of a, kind of a bad situation to go on. All right, I rambled on there with that. I'm sorry. Uh, any 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 other questions? Wayne, I'm going to rely on you to see who needs to have their mic opened or anything. Gene, because, yes, uh, it looks like Edward Edward Pribs uh, Pribis. I hope okay, I there we go. Up. Edward, are you there? I just opened your microphone. I think, although it still says, I think you have your uh, microphone. Uh, okay. Edward, are you there? Your microphone shows open now. Nope. Nothing, nothing going on there. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else want to say anything? Uh, I know that Lane is monitoring the chat. I can't seem to see the chat at the moment, but um, it's kind of gone away on mine. <laughs> yeah, my chat's gone. Oh, well. Um, anything else we need to talk about before we close it out for the day? I'm just trying to get an idea of how many people were on here. Attendee list, we have 54 people online at the moment. I know we had 69 a little bit ago. Some are, some are leaving us. All right, that's fine. All right, well, in that case, I'll just say, uh, first of all, thank you to Lane for assisting us today and, and keeping things on, the, the, on course. And thanks to all of you for attending. We have another one of these uh, sessions coming up on Friday, and that's um, uh, on loss of control. Not sure about next week. Um, I, I bit off a lot by doing three of them this week and it's been a pretty frantic week. Uh, so I won't be doing three next week. Um, I may do one next week, we'll see. And I will post it on my website. I will send out a tweet and I will send out an email notification for whatever that may happen to be. So with that, we will close it out and I will uh, stop the live stream here and I will say thank you very much for all uh, attending. Have a great uh, afternoon and be safe and uh, stay healthy, please.